from there we go to scene two where you get more drums and colors enter Menteith, Caithness, Angus, Lennox, and soldiers the drums and colors very dramatic so after this quiet conversation with the the uh with the doctor and the uh and the the, the gentlewoman when they're probably speaking in rather low tones or at least pretending to because they need to they need the crowd to hear them but they're probably trying to keep very quiet and still as they're doing that because they don't want Macbeth to hear what they are saying and talking about here in, in that last speech the doctor was talking about fearing it sounds like that uh lady Macbeth might be suicidal uh keep uh keep all means of uh remove from her the means of all annoyance uh keep her separate from everything she seems very unstable so now we go from that quietness of, you know, hushed tones and, you know, darting eyes. And now suddenly, big noise, colors, flags, music, the trumpets blaring. They're walking in, big marching crowd from these two people on stage sort of huddled. Now it's the whole stage filled with people and colors and it's very bright and it's very, uh, very blaring. So again, the contrast. And here we are with uh, the, the opposing forces coming to overthrow Macbeth. And we learn of, uh, we learn of the, the approaching English forces have joined up with Malcolm. This is classic exposition here. We learn that Malcolm's uh, brother Donald Bain is off in Ireland. And that's a whole other issue there we don't need to get into. But it is significant for, the great, for great Britain. But you get this uh, this sense that the people in general, the entire nation, the entire island of Britain are now closing in on Macbeth. The walls are closing in on Macbeth and time is running out. Scene three, we are back to Macbeth from all that crowd and he is, eh, he's not all that concerned. Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy, Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal consequence have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall ever have power upon thee. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by the heart I bear never shall sag with doubt nor shake with fear. <laughs> he doesn't care. He thinks he's invulnerable. He has been told by the witches that nobody from woman born can, uh, uh, can kill him. So he figures that, well, you know, who else is woman? Who else? Who has, you know, not been born from a woman? By definition, nobody. So I'm safe. And also he knows that no army will be able to overthrow him till Burnham Wood, a forest somewhere, will come to Dunsinane. Will the trees will stand up and march to Dunsinane, which he takes to be, well, well. As prophecies go, that seems pretty solid. He takes absolute faith in his understanding that trees don't walk. So do what you want. I'm bulletproof. And, uh, well, it doesn't really turn out that way, of course. The most interesting aspect of this scene after that, quite frankly, is... Uh, well, there are two. The, uh, we're told that he has a servant come in, and uh, you, read, uh, you read it, and he start, you know, it's somebody that we haven't seen before, but he starts calling this out, and he says, uh, Satan, I am sick at heart when I behold thee. Satan, I say. And it's sort of cute, and it is spelt a little different, but when you say it out loud in uh, in a play, S E Y T O N sounds like, of course, Satan. So here it's a little a uh, little gag here where Macbeth is uh, working with Satan, and in fact, Satan is his servant in this dynamic. 
very interesting little uh, little game there. But also the reports of his wife are troubling him in a way, but it, it, he is almost too calloused over to really engage with it. And he does start calling for, give me my armor. And that sort of gets repeated a couple of times. And that seems a little odd, quite frankly. You know, why, why always is he calling for armor in this scene? Give me my armor, put on me, help me with it on. Uh, well, think about it. Throughout, there have been these little references to, quite frankly, clothes. Clothes that don't fit. Robes. Don't dress me in borrow ro borrowed robes, he says at the very beginning. This idea of wearing something. But, of course, this is another example of uh, appearances. Of um, uh, the exterior versus the interior. And it is here him trying to buy invulnerability by putting on a physical piece of clothing uh, that won't make a damn bit of difference in his fate, ultimately. That's curious. He also hears from the doctor. He asks, how does your patient, doctor? Doctor replies, not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick-coming fancies that keep her from her rest. And Macbeth just demands, cure of that! Canst not... Canst thou not minister to a mind disease? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow. Raise out the, the written troubles of her brain. And with some sweet, oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Again, look at the uh, turns of phrase in there. Cleanse. Like she was trying to clean her hands. And in fact, he, in an earlier phase, was also worrying about his hands being bloody. So there is that going on. And also that, can't that minister to a mind diseased? Don't you have any power over uh, the interior? And of course, the doctor does not. And he himself says, no, that's out of my area. And the, uh, the inability of understanding that confusion between the physical and the spiritual, between the exterior and the interior, everything for Macbeth at this moment is in tumult. His, his exterior, he understands the world is closing in on him. And even though I would argue he seems to be putting on a brave face, not caring so much about what's going on, I think he is also manifesting some concern because he is always calling out for armor. He knows things are coming. And so he is a little agitated on the interior too. So for him, this is uh, normal. This is an equilibrium. The exterior is in chaos. The interior is in chaos. And he seems to be kind of thriving in this. But of course, the mark of a good leader is that his interior will be calm and orderly. And then a reflection of that will be seen in the world around him. His realm will also be calm and orderly. And this is a point Shakespeare is making very explicitly to the audience member with the crown, James. The uh, dismissiveness, I would say, of, uh, of Macbeth is the main import of that scene, where he's just, you know, fine, fine. Cure her. Just do it. Uh, and who cares about the rest of them? And he's just absolutely throwing himself around as a kind of pure ego, but also an outward shell. He wants to project that he doesn't care. He wants to project strength. But on the inside, perhaps it is, it is something very different. And that uh, cavalier attitude is very different dismissive of and divorced from the material realities on the ground. So it is, in its way, a sign of a tyrant. 
a sign of a ruler who is out of step with his people. And so that is the reason ultimately, much more so I would suggest than just the fact that, you know, he has killed some people along the way. That happens all the time. Those are individuals and fine, you can make little exceptions here and there. Um, from Duncan, who is his predecessor, kings rise to power and knock off the previous kings all the time. That can be explained away. Even one could argue the, uh, the, uh, the, the murder of, uh, of, uh, of Lady Macduff and, uh, and, and her child. As horrible as that is, that is one small instance of uh, a terrible murder and I'm not going to diminish that but at the same time on the grandiose level of ruler that is small but the murmurings that we are hearing among all the little people the understanding that the world around him is completely up in arms, that is the real trouble sign for a king. 